All right, hey, what's up guys? Today I wanted to do a quick video, maybe not so quick, just talking about various updates with life, with uh, car stuff, what's been going on. I haven't posted anything in a while to share with you guys and I've got several comments of, hey, what happened with the M50 budget build or what happened with Drift Week or why aren't you drifting, you know, what's going on? So I just wanted to address some of those and bring you guys up to speed a little bit, even though I'm not super invested in YouTube necessarily. I've realized that every single install I do takes two or three times longer when I film it and explain things thoroughly like I like to. So I've decided to just make progress on stuff um, otherwise and not necessarily film everything I do. Um, I don't think YouTube um, as a creator is gonna be a career for me in the foreseeable future. I just don't enjoy making videos and the content creation hustle as much as I feel like I need to for that to pursue that as like a career path and for people that feel that that's their thing by all means you know do it because that's a very lucrative way to make a living and you get to do all sorts of fun stuff so uh, don't let me discourage you it's just I don't think it's for me uh, I'm 30 years old this year so uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not sure how I feel about creating YouTube content. And I also don't think I'm good enough at presenting to make everything super, uh, funny or informative or, or eye catching. You know, I really don't like the clickbait type stuff. So all the things I need to succeed, I kind of don't want to do. Um, so that's beside the point. Um, life's kind of, you know, been in the way a little bit. I'm basically, trying to transition careers from selling auto parts and playing this race car driver role I've been doing for the, my all of my 20s basically, or at least the last half of my 20s. And I'm getting a real estate license because my family's into commercial real estate. We buy and lease um, commercial real estate. So basically I wanna transition into that role or into that field rather and uh, hopefully make a lot of money. That way I can continue to drift in the future. So. Uh, that's why there's been a lack of updates. That's also why I haven't been drifting this year. I've been get, working on getting my license, my real estate license. Um, that way I can become a broker for my family after working for four years. Um, if you guys are into real estate or anyone watching this uh, knows any connections in Austin or you just want to network with me, feel free to reach out. I know that's a, a huge uh, deal. Basically networking's everything, you know, in pretty much every line of business. But if you have anything to offer or if you have any suggestions for me, please let me know. I'm all ears and eyes. And uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, back to Drift Week. So Drift Week 1, I was involved in the very first one. Drift Week 2 is already around the corner. I'm not going to be involved in that one due to the aforementioned career choices and stuff. I'm just having to kind of buckle down and and get stuff rolling in, in the positive financial direction. So I'm not just throwing money away drifting and stuff and having fun even though I do take, you know, plenty of time off, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, where was I? Uh, back to Drift Week 1, I basically was with my family on vacation for Christmas and hadn't even built the car yet that I was intending to take and for some reason thought I could swap everything in two weeks out of my uh, coupe drift car, my E36 cage car that everyone knows. I was going to take the entire drivetrain out of that put it in the sedan I had, then it would be full interior, but with a crazy engine and drivetrain and super, you know, uh, capable of doing anything I wanted to do, dual caliper, handbrake, all that good stuff, okay? And, you know, reality hit really hard when I got back from vacation. I had two weeks left to do the, uh, the entire build, and it just didn't happen. There, there were so many things. I had to get fabricated. I had to rush fabrication, which is the worst. You're going to pay so much more. Uh, luckily I didn't because my friends are nice to me, but, um, you, you just don't want to rush a build at the last second if you, if you don't have to. And essentially I decided to go on drift week and then just didn't make a peep about it and planned nothing and then decided, Oh, I'm going to get it all done in two weeks right before the event. And that backfired big time. I'm terrible at time management. And that's something I'm learning to get better about of just estimating longer essentially. Cause I think in a perfect world, it's gonna take X amount of time and it, it's never that amount of time. So um, props to all the people that are tech savvy enough um, to pull off a last minute build like that. Like Trevor Jameson from Motion Auto TV, incredible with the TJZ Mustang. Like I could have, don't think I could have ever done that. Um, 
you know, same thing with Rudy right now. He's putting a VR30 DETT into his G35, which is incredible and also last minute. So good luck to you, uh, Rudy. But anyways, it was doomed from the start. Um, so I, I didn't get the build done. I kind of wasted some of my friends' time that were going with me because they were, you know, so gung-ho to get out to California and see all these tracks. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I'm sorry, Alias. Um let you guys down as far as not being ready sooner. I really wanted to be involved in every single event on that trip. The uh, It just it didn't work out due to my lack of preparedness, basically. So um, I still had a great time. I met a bunch of awesome people on Drift Week 1 and realized what it's all about. And basically, it also kind of changed my build methodology of how I want drift cars in the future. I want them to basically be the best drift week car possible. I want them to have air conditioning. I want them to be able to drive across country to, at a moment's notice. I want it to be powerful. I want the drivetrain to be strong, um, comfortable. I, air conditioning kind of goes along the same line of that. But, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of compromises you make when you first build a drift car. You think, oh, I'll just gut everything out, get rid of as much weight as possible, we'll make it super light, I'm going to be the fastest dude out there. And then you learn after years that that's really, there's so much more to it than that. It could be tire compound that makes all the difference or, or setup or both. Like somebody with a full weight car can go throw on a sticky tire and smoke your ass and you're, you've got this gutted out S13 that's super uncomfortable, you know, and all in the name of like being faster and you still got smoked so uh life lessons i guess as you get older you learn that kind of crap so anyways i my goal for drift cars in the foreseeable future is basically t for them to be excellent drift week cars and the only exception to that being i don't really want to cage uh, a street car i just feel like it's too intrusive i want to be able to have rear passengers safely and stuff like that and a cage really limits uh, the viability of doing that. So um, beyond the cage, you know, I don't know. You can attain them a lot of places with no cage, but uh, at higher speed tracks, it's kind of a safety issue or really is a safety issue to just have a cage. So I won't be allowed to tandem at some places with the sedan, which will not be getting a cage. Um, but yeah, the, the idea is to, to create a comfortable drift car that I wouldn't mind necessarily daily driving or driving to work or whatever. So that being said, air conditioning was a, a requirement. Excuse me, I can't talk. Air conditioning is a requirement in Texas, especially, as well as heater, wipers, all that stuff, power windows, radio. Um, and the engine that came out of my coupe has an equal link twin scroll, really fancy exhaust manifold on it, but it doesn't allow for fitment of the AC compressor because it's equal length. So that engine essentially, unless I take the manifold off and put it on a different engine, can never run air conditioning. And I don't see a reason to take off that fancy manifold off of my fancy built engine and put it on a less lesser built engine or stock engine for that matter. Um, so basically that uh, plan of, of swapping the coupe drivetrain over to the sedan didn't really work out because I can't run it air conditioning. And I also have an ATI crank damper, harmonic, harmonic damper, that also can't clear uh, or doesn't have a provision for the AC pulley on the front. So those two things combined, I, I, there's no way I can run air conditioning with that engine. So I was just like, okay, well, maybe I should put together another setup like I originally planned with the whole budget bill thing of, you know, a simpler setup that maybe makes 400 wheel or so that can run air conditioning. And then I'll just put the engine that came out of the coop right back into it. So essentially that's the plan. I know I've rambled on, on a lot of different topics already and it's about to be 10 minutes long already, but the entire coupe drivetrain uh, that came out of it is going back into it. The coupe's gonna be the exact same car. Um, I may change turbos on it, I'm not sure, but it's pretty much gonna be the same ripper it was, 650 wheel, like it's been making for years and years and years now. When I do pull the engine out of the sedan to put it back in the coupe, I am gonna check bearings and look at it just to make sure everything's healthy, but I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be. The The oil filters are clean every time I look at them. I always like look in the little folds of the paper uh, for debris, and I have had a major bearing failure before when I lost an oil pump gear, and the oil filter was just absolutely loaded with material. So I haven't seen anything um, 
remotely even two percent of that so you know there's a speck of dirt and stuff here and there but drifting's really dirty i don't know if you guys know you inhale a crap load of tire smoke through the air filter all the time especially when you're you know following someone in tandem all that stuff goes through your engine so change your filters um anyways i'm gonna check bearings and if it needs bearings which i really doubt because these engines don't typically ruin bearings they have really good oiling systems um, then I'll put bearings in it if it needs them. If not, I'm just throwing it right back in the coop. The sedan is getting an M50 non-Vanos engine, which has currently been, it's been at the machine shop for a while. I've got a really awesome machine shop hookup here in Austin. Uh, I'm not going to name drop because he's already too busy, but he does excellent work. He's really good friends with my family and he's working on it, but I'm also not pressuring him time-wise at all because he's got so many other builds it seems like everyone during the pandemic is working on a car fixing all their stuff hot rodding everything everyone's super busy in the car world for some reason despite everything else being real slow um but the machine shop's basically been super busy so he's got a block over there for me for it's an m50 non-vanos engine so he's got a head and a block um I have the pistons and rods and all the internals and stuff myself. I disassembled it already before I sent it over there to make it nice and easy for them to do their work without having to take a bunch of stuff apart. I try to make it as simple as possible for them. So they're going to do a cylinder hone, a light hone on the walls just to make sure I have a true bore that's nice and true, I guess. And um, even though I did see the factory cross hatching on the walls still, you know, at a 90 degree angle, you can see the pattern in, in there. And that basically proves that the cylinder is not super worn out if you can still see that. Um, so it may not need a hone. A lot of people just get away with a super simple like pop and drop head studs on these M50s. They won't even take the head off. They just take the head bolts out one by one, replace them with ARPs, torque them and send it. Um, I've taken enough M50s apart now that have broken uh, chain guides, uh, timing chain guides, to where I don't really feel like that's necessarily a reliable uh, option anymore. Just because of the age of the plastics and stuff on those engines, they're getting to be 20, you know, between 20 and 30 years old now. They're between 1992 and 1999 production, so or 91 to 99 uh, for the M50. So M50 based stuff. Um, so that being said, uh, I'm gonna put all new guides in it, chains, uh, weld the oil pump gear, probably do baffles in the oil pan because that's cheap insurance to make sure the oil stays near the pickup. Even though they're a rear sump pan, which is better for drifting than a front sump, they still can starve a little bit um, when you get a lot of grip in the setup. So uh, baffles, weld the oil pump nut gear. All right, oil pump gear nut whatever weld the nut to the uh to the gear and then that basically prevents them from backing off ever which is the issue on the rev limiter at high rpm sometimes the oil pump nuts get back off it's a very common thing everybody knows about it so i won't talk about that anymore um so m50 non vanos is the plan it's gonna be stock pistons stock bearings stock mains the only things i'm really doing i should talk about instead are cut ring head gasket arp head studs um, I'm doing an S52 intake cam, and then I'm doing an M50 non-Vanos intake cam in the exhaust position. So that's kind of a hot cam swap you can do for cheap where you basically run, you take the intake off of non-Vanos and put it in the exhaust position. It requires a slight amount of machining uh, somewhere, I think, on the, the face of the cam, but that'll be easy to do or get done rather. And then I'm using custom timing blocks as well uh, from Perry Hubling. Thanks so much, Perry. He's got these timing blocks that install at the back of the head. Typically, they're just like this big metal piece that bolts on the head and keeps the cams completely square. So they're straight up and down. They've got these square cutouts in the back that locate them, essentially. And you put these blocks in that hold it completely square, and that's stock timing for the cams. But... Those engines are all designed to be 180 to 200 horse, 240 horsepower, naturally aspirated six cylinders. They're not designed for turbo power bands or anything, and they're definitely not optimized cam settings for turbo. So if you want better spool or if you want more top and power, there are advantages to setting the cam centers slightly 
you know, one way or another, retarded or advanced intake or exhaust uh, from the stock centers. Uh, so a guy named Perry on um, Facebook, Perry Hubling, sells these cam blocks and I bought a full set. He's got from two to 14 degrees and he also has recommended settings for each for max spool basically is what I'm going for. So I'm trying to make the widest power band possible, spool the turbo as early as possible because with drifting you basically want like a rally style power band where the turbo just comes in immediately as soon as you breathe on the throttle. That way you don't have to clutch kick a bunch and feather the clutch and all that other stuff. Um, so, completely stock M50 non-Vanos, S52 intake cam, M50 non-Vanos intake cam in the exhaust position. I'm gonna add Vanos, so you can grind on the head. There's a little spot on the head on non-Vanos heads that prevents the Vanos from seating all the way. And all you have to do is grind that out and then run Vanos cams and uh, cam trays, and then you can just put Vanos on a non-Vanos head. Advantage there, is that the non-Vanos head has seven millimeter valve stems instead of six millimeter. So they're much less prone to braking or failure at high RPM. Basically the valve head can break off of the stem because they're two piece welded. And it's much less common or pretty much unheard of on the seven millimeter valve stems, even though they have slightly less airflow because they're a larger diameter, blah, blah, blah. Um, they're more reliable. Then also, they, the non-Vanos head has dual valve spring stock. So they've got like 80 pounds of seat pressure or so, something very similar to a SuperTech setup you would purchase for six, $700 um, to put on a Vanos head. They've already got that much seat pressure with the non-Vanos head. So the valve springs are already good. The, the valves are good. You don't really need to worry about upgrading the valves. You know, if you're gonna be on the limiter all the freaking time, you, need to think about stuff like that. You need to think about your valve spring, you need to think about your valves. In my built engine, I do have upgraded SuperTech valves that are one piece so that I can't have that kind of failure with the stock valve. Um, there's no point in spending thousands of dollars building an engine only to have a, a single valve fail and it just ruined the whole thing. So, you know, a set of valves is kind of cheap insurance. Or you can just run a non-Vanos head, which is the budget oriented version here. So you take the non-Vanos head, you grind down one little spot on the front, you put in Vanos cams and trays, add Vanos to the front. Now you've got great valve springs, strong valves. You can support 800 plus wheel horsepower and torque um, without valve float and 8,000 plus RPMs um, on the stock hydraulic lifters. So that's that's all I will ever need. You know, my even my built engines only ever dyno 639 at the highest. So. And I'm gonna keep it there, I keep it at that power all the time, but still, it's, that's all it's ever made. So 800 is more than enough. Um, and then the bottom end, the M50 non-Vanos rods are super thick, so are the Vanos rods, really. The rods are fine. It's the pistons that break, um, and they break because the rings butt together. So the ring gap's too small for the amount of heat generated from the turbo setup and having so much more power than stock. Um, but you just have to gap the rings larger. You leave a little bit of gap there, a little extra gap, so that when they expand a lot more from the additional heat created by the turbo and way more power, heat is proportional to power essentially, um, then they won't butt together and they won't, once the rings butt together, there's nowhere to go, so they shove one way or another, and then that basically presses on the upper or lower ring land, and that's what breaks the ring land. So if you keep the gap enough to where it can expand, the ring can essentially get longer and still not touch at the end, then you are substantially less likely to break those ring lands. Um, also, E85 really helps apparently keep the combustion temps down on stock pistons. I haven't really experimented with pushing stock pistons super far yet, um, but we're gonna find out. I mean, I'm about to run basically a completely stock M50 non-Vanos. It's got a little bit of cam difference, and I'm adding Vanos, ARP head studs, and a cut ring head gasket, and that's it. So, um, it's got, uh, let's see, where was I with that? That's the plan for the sedan, and that's what the engine I'm waiting for on the machine shop right now. So they basically need to deck the head, they're gonna do a valve job for me if it needs it, uh, check to see if the valve seals are leaking, or if the valve guides are leaking, replace those if needed, um, and then, they're gonna deck the block, do a light hone on the block, then I'm gonna I'm gonna gap the rings myself, put the pistons and rods back in it with the stock crank and everything else. ARP head studs, uh, cut ring head gasket, JE cut ring, 
and uh, then those cams, like I mentioned, and that'll be it. Um, I'm also gonna rebuild the Vanos unit, but that's kind of a trivial thing. It's just uh, replacing seals and things. Um, and you can get rebuild kits for cheap for most BMWs from a company called Bayesian Systems, B-E-I-S-A-N. Maybe there's a Y in there, I'm not sure, but you can find it with enough Google Foo. Um, but that's the rebuild company to go to because it doesn't cost an insane amount. Uh, so I'll do that, and then also fresh guides and chains and stuff because the front timing cover's off. It'd be absolutely stupid to not do a tensioner and, and guides while you're in there. Um, so yeah, that's the plan for the sedan. Once that engine is ready, once those pieces are ready from the machine shop, I'm going to assemble it. Once it's completely assembled, I'll put on the exhaust manifold and everything. I'm gonna be running a Rapid Spool Industries, AKA RSI manifold. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a really reliable and inexpensive manifold. It's a great option for E30 swap cars or E36 and E39 cars that run M50 based engines. Uh, the dude that runs the company's name is Otis. He's a great guy. It has awesome weight, wastegate priority. It's really strong welding. It's not gonna crack on you. It's not some cheap eBay shit, nothing like that. I also opted for the V-band um, upgrade. So it's got, instead of an open scroll T4 uh, flange, it's a V-band flange. So I'm gonna be running a Borg Warner EFR 7163 uh, V-band inlet turbo on this V-band manifold. So that actually is really nice for clocking and things, gives you a lot more flexibility, and the V-band housings are uh, more compact than any of the T3 or T4 housings. So you have more clearance to the valve cover and stuff like that. For a top mount setup, that's you know usually pretty important just so you don't fry all your ignition stuff or have clearance issues pulling the valve cover off and having to remove you know a billion things so 22 minutes now wow okay um so that's the plan that's what i've been doing that's why i'm not drifting i'm waiting on the engine from the machine shop and i haven't been rushing them because i get an insane deal basically and uh i'm not in a rush to do it you know necessarily i don't i'm not pressed for any dates or anything i'm not trying to make an event necessarily i'm just trying to get it running and perfect in my eyes as far as like a drift week style car that's going to be really comfortable and all that so for now the sedan's going to keep the coupe drivetrain that it has in it until the other engine's ready then once the other engine's ready i'm gonna you know take the coupe engine out or the built engine out rather swap in the m50 non vanos with the new turbo setup and ac and then i'll assess the bearings on the other one and then put it back in the coupe and then i'll have both cars running um, so that's pretty much it. What else do I need to touch on? I'm trying to think of other questions I've had lately. The M50 turbo budget build or whatever that I, I called this initially for the sedan spiraled way out of control, which happens with all of my builds. Cause I, um, understand technology that's out there and I understand how much better it is than some of the other stuff so when I try to go for a budget setup I end up getting you know lesser parts like a journal bearing turbo and a cast manifold and and stuff like that and they work incredibly well they do but in the back of my mind I'm like man I could have that gamma titanium turbine wheel Ooh, that'd be cool and then I just spend stupid amounts of money and I end up like getting an EFR, selling the simple setup, wasting a bunch more. It's gonna be sick once it's done, but I delay myself all the time by scope creep of just making the bill. Oh, well, you know what? Maybe she'll run on E85. Should probably do dual fuel pumps and a surge tank. Maybe I could push it to instead of 400, make like 550. Let's No, just keep it, it's fine. Just as long as it starts every time and can get you laps. It's fine, um, but I have to remind myself of that constantly. So that's the uh, snowballing plan. If you guys also haven't seen the updates of the sedan, it has Big Duck, Big Duck Club um, over fenders now. It has uh, Apex wheels, got some new spacers and studs for Motorsport hardware. And um, yeah, it's really coming along. I need to paint it, but that's another huge expense that I don't wanna pay for, so. We'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully by the end of the year, 
I'll have both cars up and running. I'll have the coupe back in its, you know, super powerful, fun glory days, whatever. And uh, then the sedan will be nice with AC and everything else working. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the update, guys. Uh, that's, I've said uh so many times now. I'm really noticing it at the end here because I forget what I'm talking about. But that's the updates on the cars, drifting. Uh, if you have any other questions or anything specific that you want to know about or you want details on anything, let me know. I mean, I'm always open to answer questions. I haven't really been making these YouTube videos because like I said at the beginning, they just take so much time. And it's this one's just completely shot on my iPhone. I'm not gonna edit it at all. I just upload it in one shot. That way you guys get something. Um, and it's not just uh, wasted space or wasted time. So that's that. And hopefully I will have some more cool drifting content or, or fun turbo BMW stuff for you guys soon. Uh, the, turbo e34 wagon that my dad has i work on it here and there i don't know if everyone on youtube is familiar with that car but it's getting a 2.8 liter setup soon along with an efr as well um and it's going to make probably like 450 wheel or something so that stay tuned for that it's going to be a pretty sweet sleeper wagon so thanks for watching see you guys next time